You know, this program wasn't about uh, condemning Japan for being different. Uh, this, isn't right. a, this isn't a question of cultural relativism. This is, you know, we're posing a very, I think, distinct and clear question about underage sex and not, you know, Japan's sexual practices in total. Hey guys, I'm Simon Ostrovsky and this is On The Line. Today we are taking questions about our most recent uh, documentary called uh, School Girls For Sale In Japan. It's all about um, the Japanese obsession with schoolgirl culture, cutesy culture, but it's also talking about the dark side of that because it's not all fun and games. We've also got um, Jake Edelstein uh, co-hosting with us from Japan. It's the middle of the night over there. Uh, Jake has... Uh, a huge knowledge about Japan and Japanese culture. He's been there for around two decades. He wrote a book called Tokyo Vice. Uh, he's contributed uh, to uh, Vice News in the past as well. Um, so you can ask all of the really complicated questions to him and all the really easy ones you can direct to me. So let's get started with our first caller. Yeah, so hey Simon, hey Jake, thanks for coming on guys. Um, let's start with the first caller indeed, and that's Dana. So let's say hey to Dana. Hey Dana. Hi, Simon. Hi, Jake. And thank you, Michael. Um, so I really enjoyed the documentary. It, it was a good way to look at this, like, innocent school young girls, but also how, like you said, there's a really dark side. Um, I know that you talked about how this, this school, the idea of the sexualization of a schoolgirl is not new. Um, it's, it's not just to Japan either. But where did that actual fetish begin? Um, where did this hypersexualization of young girls come from and of young women globally? And does it have any connection to, in Japan, the Japanese geisha movement where um, it wasn't just sexual stimulation, it was also mental stimulation as well and through conversations and such? Mm. I can't comment on globally. Uh, in Japan, I think that there's always been an interest in uh, young girls, even in ancient Japanese literature like the tale of Genji. Um, this phenomenon of compensated dating didn't really start until the 90s. Um, and it, it was basically young girls being paid money to walk with men or have dinner with them, or go to restaurants with them. There have been so many variations over the, over the years. Um, the most recent one is called JK Business, and it basically involves um, non-sexual meetings and often turns into something sexual or, and ends up as prostitution a fair amount of the time. There's no statistics to say how many of these sort of JK Businesses things actually involve sexual intercourse, um, but there's certainly a tendency to, for it to go that way, and the police have been cracking down on those places uh, quite extensively since 2012. But I think some people would say that, you know, this is just a continuation of Japan's ancient culture and therefore it's okay. Do you agree with that? No. Um, Japan has laws that forbid employing women under 18 in sexual related businesses. Uh, Japan has signed the Child, uh, the Rights of Children Convention with the United Nations. It signed the anti-trafficking protocols with the United Nations. Um, it has a duty and laws that forbid this, so it's not acceptable. It's not something that Japanese themselves have decided was okay. Uh, admittedly, Japan's attitudes towards the sexualization of children and those things is way back. I think this year, finally, possession of child pornography became a crime for the first time. Um, last year, they created the laws which outlawed it, but they gave people one year to get rid of all their child pornography primarily because one in ten Japanese men possessed it or have viewed it at some point in time. So you can see that, you know, you don't want to put everybody in jail. Uh, the local police have started handing out pamphlets saying, you know what, you can't have child pornography anymore, guys. Throw it away. And I think we're not trying to say that um, it's, it's all bad, but I think the most striking thing for me when we were doing um, this documentary was the proximity of a giant multi-level police station um, to the Akihabara neighborhood in Tokyo, where all of these underage prostitutes essentially are standing, lining the road, and handing out flyers. And 
the police, if they wanted to crack down on it, all they would need to do would be to walk out of their station literally two blocks down the road and you know, make it disappear. Um, and I think the fact that it's happening so openly and under their nose, that's what distincts, um, it distinguishes Japan from the rest of the world, not the fact that um, Japan is alone in sexualizing young women. That happens everywhere. Um, but I think to, to talk a little bit about some of the more innocent stuff that's going on, they have these idol groups in Japan, which are amazing collections of lots of young women um, who get up on stage and dance, and they've got adoring fans, and a lot of these bands aren't actually um, you know, very well known. They have a hardcore small group of fan to co who come, fans who come to all of the concerts, and uh, we've actually got a clip from the uh, documentary, which we can show you, so you can find out what it's like, what happens after the concert is really interesting as well. JK fans usually have a favorite girl, and they're fiercely devoted to her. Some even pay money for a chance at a little FaceTime after the show. I guess this is an opportunity for all of the fanboys to get to know the band a little bit better. They can buy Polaroid pictures of them, they can meet them and speak with them. It's pretty innocent when it's just teenagers meeting teenagers, but so that guy's a little bit older. OK, so that last guy there, he was really, really old. But um, Dana, do you, I think you have another question. Yes, I do. Um, and so whether or not the business that the girl's doing is innocent or actually underage prostitution, what happens to these girls when they are no longer a little girl? What do they go on to in a society that thinks that education and science and technology is so important in a society that's known to, like you said in it, misogynistic and and can shame those girls if it's known that they were part of this business. What is left for them afterwards? Mainstream prostitution, um, going out and garnering more girls for the uh, business. What becomes of them when they're a woman and not a girl? You know, it's like all, all things, there's a kind of a gray zone there, is that some of these girls, you know, they do the job. They don't get too heavily involved in it. They keep their noses clean. They go on to college. Um, they lead normal lives. It's it's a phase. It's a money making thing. It's a it's an opportunity. Um, a lot of the girls that really get deeply sucked into the business and end up in prostitution are runaways, girls who are um, don't have a home to go back to and can't earn any money. And they are the ones that are really victimized. And when they're no longer young, um, they go into the regular sex industry, or maybe they go into porn. Um, or they become hostesses. You know, J Japan's sex industry is, is legal. Uh, everything that you could possibly want in terms of s sexual services except actual vaginal penetration is legal. You can advertise it. Um, there's this little magazine here that they distribute in Shibuya and various places. This lists all the various um, sex jobs that you can get with little cute illustrations of, you know, your uniform and what you would want. And these aren't particularly illegal because the services they're advertising and the girls that they're recruiting are doing things that are quasi-legal. But are they legal if you're under 18? No, they're not legal if you're under 18. But if you're, if you're employing a girl, here's one of the reasons these places stay in business. Let's say you're employing a girl um, to make origami cranes um, in scanty clothes. So, you know, you Which is so customer. twisted, by the way. Yeah, it is. It is really twisted, actually, or it's folded, to be precise. Sorry, for yeah, the terrible yeah. pun. But um, the, the fact is that the people running these places, they're on the borderline of, of what is legal. Um, and if they get busted by the cops, the fine for hiring these girls to do this job uh, is $3,000. It's a violation of the basic labor standards law. So if you're making you know $10,000 a month doing this and you get shut down and find three thousand dollars it's not gonna hurt well, I thought the interesting thing you were um, telling me when I was in Tokyo and we were shooting this was how the fact that Japan's economy 
um, has been on the decline for the last two decades has really changed and, and sort of played into um, the availability of uh, schoolgirls uh, for the sex industry and for the uh, various JK um, businesses that exist. Can you tell us about how that has affected it in Japan? Sure. I mean, when we were talking in the 90s, right, the stereotype you had of these girls who were involved in the JK business, which was called Enjoko Sight, was that they, you know, they wanted to buy a Louis Vuitton bag, they wanted to buy brand clothes, and they were you know, prostituting themselves out for spare money. And now you have girls doing this because they have no other way to make a living. Um, the number of people in poverty in Japan has really increased in the last two decades. One in every six children is, is in poverty. Why is that? Which, which is poor economy changes in the labor laws under Koizumi, which made it so possible to use temporary labor instead of hiring people for life. Yeah. I mean, Japan used to have this sort of lifetime employment system that has been gutted. So you have many people who have, you know, their lives are temporary workers. You work at a company for four years. If you work there for five years, they have to hire you as a permanent worker. And they almost always get canned before they get that permanent job. So. Uh, you know, there's not as much upward mobility as there is, and if you have more, you have more divorce, more single mothers. Japan is not friendly towards single mothers. But so have, what I understood was that you know the whole economy is shrinking as a whole. It leaves uh, people out on the margins who never expected to be living in poverty. You know, just 10, 15 years ago, and um, and there's no social net. Uh, for those people in Japan, because Japan has always had a growing economy, didn't really need a social net. And so there's nowhere for these women or young girls to go to seek help. Is that part of the problem? Yeah, there, there's not. There's a very, there's a huge shortage of shelters. There's no real infrastructure for taking care of kids that run away from home because they're abused or they're not taken, taken care of, and that contributes to the problem. I, ironically, one of the things that has contributed to the exploitation and the recruiting of these young girls for sexual services is Japan got very serious about human trafficking um, 2006, 2007, and they put laws banning it on the books. Um, I work with Lighthouse Japan, which used to be called Polaris Project Japan, and it used to be that most of the women that we handled, the trafficking victims, were foreign women. But as Japan shut out foreign women and made it much harder to traffic them, then you know, sexual exploitation is such a money-making business that it's slowly shifted more and more towards underage girls, Japanese girls. So it's gone from international trafficking of women to domestic trafficking of young girls. And the ways that they're lured into the business and sort of put in, made indentured, serv indentured servants is complicated and sometimes very hard to prove as a case of human trafficking. OK, Dana, I think we've veered off from your question a little bit. Um, did, that, did that answer mostly the question for you? Yes, that did, and more. So thank you both very much. OK, anything else? Um, no, um, the only other thing I was interested in was seeing a connection between the business there and as well as here with human trafficking of minors. And, and I think um, Jake has talked about a lot of that luring in and lack of services and that definitely connects to the American um, child trafficking that is very not as well known as this Japanese JK business, but um, not as much flaunted. But I think you both really answered some of those questions. Yeah, at least the child sex business in the United States has the decency to like, hide itself. I think <laughs> we could uh, agree that you know, Japan, yeah. Japan's version is very, very much in your face, even though it's illegal too. Great, thank you both. Yeah, thanks, Dana, for You're coming welcome. on. Um, so, Simon, Jake, we got a, we're getting a bunch of tweets, and we're going to keep watching Twitter while the show's live. But I want to take a, this, a look at this one that Claudio sent, and I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Claudio wants to know, um, Simon, when you saw that guy uh, who seemed to be a pimp out in the street, and he asked you to stop recording the girls, did you feel like you were threatened? And I think uh, what Claudio is getting at is a, a larger question about the state of journalism in Japan. So, um, can you guys address that? Like, let's talk about that scene, and also uh, a little bit about uh, the status of journalism in Japan. 
I think maybe I didn't uh, understand how real the threat was, but our Japanese cameraman was really tweaked out about that and very, very nervous. And so I guess some of his nervousness um, passed, uh, passed over to me. But I think the strangest thing about that encounter was actually that he came up to us and he said, you can't film these girls because they're underage, you know, citing Japanese legislation on who you can put on TV, which <laughs> is maybe the most ironic thing you could ever hear from let's say, an alleged pimp. That is, that is great. Um, you know, the Japanese media gets a reputation for being a bunch of lapdogs, and there is some truth to that, uh, especially the major media organizations. Um, since the Abe administration took over, and, and especially since the nuclear accident, Japan's ranking in the World Press Freedom Index has gone from number 10 out of 100 and some countries in 2010 to number 61 um, last year, so it's kind of reaching Croatian levels. Uh, Japanese media, there's some issues that they don't like to report on. They really do not like to report on organized crime issues um, unless the police have made an arrest or something because organized crime here is scary. Well, and I, and and I think also a core part of being a journalist is about confronting people, and a core part of being Japanese is about never, ever, ever entering into any kind of a confrontation. So you know, the two uh, philosophies really don't work together. Yeah. Um, con being confrontational is sometimes considered rude. So press conferences in Japan can be, you know, like a series of softball questions. And often, if it's a, if it's a government organization or it's a, a major corporation, um, the questions have to be submitted in advance, which means that that's not going to result in much of an answer because they already know what to say. It's yeah. all prepared. It's like a staged play. I think, um, Michael, you maybe have another caller for us. Well, to... Simon, it's like you, you've done this show before. Uh, in fact, we yeah. do. <laughs> Let's say hey to Ben. Ben's on Skype. Hey, Ben. Hey. Yeah, I had kind of a similar kind of question uh, with the Japanese culture in mind. Uh, how could journalists most strategically approach this problem in a way that will lead to lasting change, especially because there's kind of this dislike of whistleblowers and stuff like that? Well, we actually spoke to one uh, whistleblower, sort of an advocate for um, these uh, schoolgirls who are left out on the street, um, Yumeno Nito, and uh, you know, she told us that it was really difficult for her because there was very few uh, people uh, like her out there who wanted to help these people, and they actually blame the girls themselves most of the time instead of uh, trying to stop the adults. And she can perhaps answer your question a little bit better than I. Uh, we've got a clip from her that comes from the doc. うる少女Okay, so she's basically just talked about how uh, people blame um, the young girls themselves. But I think, you know, that's really awful because if you're under 18 and you don't have your head straight, you're not, you know, you can't, adults can't be blaming those people. They have to really go after the adults because they're at the core of this problem. Yeah. Um, so, uh, in terms of journalists, I think for journalists, their job is always to go around exposing things that people don't want to be exposed, um, and that's the, I think that's the only real um, responsibility that we have, is to continue talking about it. I don't think there's anything particularly special that needs to be done in any particularly special way, but as long as people are um, unhappy with what we're uncovering, then we're probably doing our job right. Um, I, Nemo is another person who's really great to speak to. Also, she couldn't be with us because she is home with her kids. Um, Fujiwara um, Shioko at Polaris, where at Lighthouse Japan, sent this message because at 1 a.m. she can't be here because it's late in Japan. Um, she says that they have many cases of teenage girls' exploitation that they deal with, um, both prostitution and pornography. Like Yuma Inochan said, these girls don't have a safe place to sleep. Prostitution and sex industry is the only option they have to live. And the Johns who buy them. Um, Enjo Kosai, our compensated dating, is very easy for them. 
uh, and many of the, their clients sleep with old men just to survive, and the society doesn't question it in Japan. The hotels allow child prostitution, and Johns are always anonymous. Um, some of the customers will take photos of the girls and then threaten to expose them to their families or to their schools, um, and thus encourage them not to report to the police. So, you know, it's a huge problem, and the girls, because they are often blamed for being victims, uh, have little recourse to, to what to do. Um, and yeah, and I think, you know, the other part of the answer is uh, how do you stop the demand? Uh, and I think the only real way to stop the demand is to is for the police to enforce the legislation that's already on the books and to arrest and prosecute adults who have sex with underage people. I mean, it seems pretty straightforward to me, but I, I think that the Japanese uh, struggle with that concept. Yeah, they, they, they struggle, and the, the police do what they can, but if a girl is over 18, um, it's not really a prosecutable crime, and even Japan's anti-prostitution laws basically make prostitution illegal, but there's no punishment for the girl or the man, meaning... Well, listen, just to get things straight, I mean, I'm not 100% certain that I'm against prostitution generally. I think it's, you know, up to um, consenting adults what they do with their, with their body. I just think, you know, once it's under 18 and it's children, I think everybody can agree that if you're having sex for money, something um, very wrong is going on. Yeah, I think for girls under 18, um, it's a serious problem because they're, we consider them minors and their judgment is impaired and therefore, that's why it's banned. Any more questions, Ben? Yeah, actually, uh, about that, uh, you kind of talked about a gray zone where exploitation uh, might occur, but doesn't necessarily, uh, but you said it's generally risky for them. And couldn't you get a lot of criticism that says like, oh, well, this is lazy, it's just speculation, you know, where it's just you know, the, the hard data. Because I know like it's typically really difficult to get a lot of good data in these situations. So kind of what, how do you work around that? Well, as with anything, you know, there are sort of innocent things that go on and there are things that are not so innocent. And just because uh, part of the JK culture is innocent doesn't mean that we can't talk about the part of it that's illegal. And um, some of the comments I saw come up under the story or on Twitter seemed pretty strange to me because people were saying, um, you know, why are you accusing these idle band groups of being prostitutes? That's not what we're doing at all. We're trying to give an overview of uh, the schoolgirl culture in Japan, which includes both the uh, idle bands uh, and uh, the actual underage prostitutes. And um, you can't go around saying that there are no underage prostitutes because we talked to one. We've got a clip of one. Uh, we can play that for you now as well. It's the one with the blurred face. So you so understood, understood that uh, you were supposed to walk with uh, these men, but you thought that that was all you had to do. When you were under the age of 18, did you ever take uh, money for having sex with these guys? So, you know, it's not very gray for her. She's over 18 now. She's telling us about stuff that happened when she was under 18, which included taking money um, for sex. But, uh, Jake, maybe you can tell us a little bit more uh, about, you know, the other kind of activities that happen in JK culture, um, you know, which are just weird rather than uh, dark. Well, I mean, for one of the things that there used to be in 2012, 2011, there was the JK Kengaku Club or the JK visual tour club where you would watch girls in a room and sometimes you could pay money and they would take off their panties and slip them to you under the door and you would have a fresh pair of panties and that's technically not anything sexual but is certainly really weird. Uh, uh, Japan's has this, Japan's biggest most successful band is called AKB48. Um, it was founded by some individuals with organized crime connections. One of the founders used to work for a loan shark. There's photos of him with members of the Yamaguchi Gumi Kodogumi, a, a 
group that no longer exists, but I particularly dislike as far as Yakuza go. Um, and one of the things about AKB48 is, is sort of to market this, this fantasy that this girl could be yours, is that the girls have to sign a contract not to have sex or romantic relationships with anybody while they're in the band. And it strikes some of us as that being rather unconstitutional. I mean, human trafficking is when you force women to have sex against their will, um, and then are you, you farm them out for sex and you give them some money, but under coerced conditions, and this is where they basically control the girl's sexuality so they can sell these men this fantasy that this woman could be yours. And every time one of these girls actually gets caught, God forbid, actually having a boyfriend, um, then there's a big who to do about it. And the whole operation is kind of sleazy, but it's a great kind of con game, right? These guys pay money to buy the CDs, to shake hands with the girls, to vote for their favorite idol in these nationally televised elections. And the group, uh, the management collects all the money, and the girls get paid crappy wages. Um, they neglect their education while they're in this band, and when they graduate, they don't have much to do. There's been five of them have gone into uh, porn pornography after they graduate. And there's probably more who go into what they call mizu shobai, or the water trade, which is basically being a hostess, being a snack mama, doing some kind of variation of uh, making men feel good about themselves. Sounds benevolent. Uh, <laughs> um, what else have we got that you were wondering about, Ben? Uh, well, you actually answered uh, my questions pretty well, so thanks a lot. Appreciate it. <laughs> and, and ben, thanks for uh, coming on the show, man. So, uh, Simon, Jake, um, we are getting a bunch of tweets, and let's look at a couple of these. We got two tweets that are pretty similar. Uh, James wants to know, who's profiting from child sex in Japan? And uh, Julian just tweeted us asking, how much of the JK industry is controlled by the Yakuza or other organized crime networks? So, you know, is it Yakuza? Is it someone else? Who's making the money here? Yeah, Jake. Who's making the money? Who's making the money is, it's uh, it's not always the Yakuza. Sometimes you have people, sort of free operators, who are paying money to work within that turf. Um, you have women who are doing this as free agents. Um, uh, definitely, there have been many cases in which JK businesses were run by organized crime groups or organized crime affiliated groups, and then they've been busted. Um, but, you know, if you charge... 30,000 yen, which is like 300 bucks, to have sex with a high school girl, and, you're, and you've got 10 girls in your stable, and you have a couple customers a night for all these girls, that's a lot of money in a month. Um, and for organized crime, that's attractive. Um, and maybe they pay the girls half of what they get, um, some of the more benevolent, if you want to use the word operations. Mm -hmm. OK, so the Yakuza aren't involved in all of it. By the way, for the uninitiated, what are the Yakuza? The Yakuza are, are, are a term for the 21 organized crime groups in Japan that exist legally um, and collect most of the revenue through extortion, loan sharking, fraud, uh, and other violent activities, and also a lot of uh, white collar crime these days as well. Um, they are technically legal. They are regulated under the Japanese law, kind of like the way the, the um, SEC regulates Goldman Sachs in the United States. Oh, okay. So they're sort of semi-official, a semi-official mafia. A semi-official mafia with Sem offices and business cards and fan magazines. Sounds like Russia minus the fan magazines. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, with, with that, let's, uh, let's say hey to our next uh, Skype caller. Let's say hey to Jen. Uh, Jen, you there still? Yep, still here. Hey, Jen. Hi. Hi, Simon and Jake. Thanks for having me. Um, so I just have one question, uh, well, a couple of questions, but what is the relationship between the JK business and the other forms of both legal and Ill illegal prostitution in Japan? In other words, um, does the JK business funnel into hostess clubs or the soap lands or health services? Because for these type of services, these are, um, like you said, Jake, somewhat quasi-regulated. Yeah, I mean, kind of think of sort of the JK business as a, a gateway to climbing up the adult entertainment business ladder. Um, so a lot of girls start in the JK business and then move to snack bars or hostesses. 
but the biggest trend right now in, in sort of hostess clubs and sex shops is what they call jukujo places, jukujo being mature women. So women in like clubs that specialize with women in their 40s or 50s for young men or older men who want to have a comfortable sexual relationship or quasi-dating relationship with somebody who's more motherly, less threatening. There's also the sort of opposite problem uh, in uh, Japan I've heard of, which is that you know the birth rate is way down, and there's a lot of couples that live together but never have sex with each other. What's that all about? Oh, the, the sexless problem in Japan. Yeah. The joke is that you know if you ask, you know people in Japan have a high sexless rate if you're talking about who they're married to, but outside of marriage, if you include those numbers, it's not as bad as it looks. Um, in Japan, marriage doesn't necessarily ha we, we don't we don't have the same idea of marriage in Japan as we do in the United States. That you know, especially after kids are born, it's very common for the man to decide that his wife is more of a mother and not an object of sexual desire. Especially when you sleep with the kid in the same room, I mean, it's kind of hard to have sex next to your kids. And so many men sort of seek sexual relationships outside of the marriage, uh, and that may contribute and that contributes to the whole hostess, snack club, prostitution industry as well. If people would actually go home and have sex with their partners, maybe they wouldn't be going out to JK businesses or um, hostess clubs. Uh, did you have another question? Um, yes, I guess this is sort of um, just piggyback off what Jake has just uh, mentioned, and I guess is more of a cultural question, um, because I guess going I Japan has always been an isolated island and I guess it's really quite an oddball to foreigners when it comes to these X-rated films um, and shops so but I guess most Japanese men you know will graduate some, from school find some corporate work um, and after some times pass get married and um, if they do do this pattern it's been I guess quite a lonely road for them because the men are you know essentially the breadwinners in most cases and so they work their butts off, they hate their boss, they don't really social with other friends of friends, they don't really branch out. And then they go home to their wives who basically stay home all the day, um, most of the day. So what do they do in, in, I guess, in between all this time? You know, I think it's, the question is, can we just um, accept for them for who they are? Because it's, it's more of like a, I guess, cultural, no, I, um, I, I don't understanding. think. I, I mean, I, I think you have a really good point. One of the problems with Japan is you have these incredibly long working hours, right? right. If you're if you're going to work at, you know, and, and many people are commuting an hour a day. If you're going to work at nine and you come home at eleven every night, well, when is there time to have a social life? If you're, right. if you're when is there time to find someone to date? When is there time some time to find someone to, mar to marry? The, the Japanese government started last month to encourage its workers to come in early and go home early so that they would actually spend time with their families. Because someone must have realized, if you don't have time with your family, you're not going to have time to procreate. Because that requires time. And, and actually, you're not being so physically tired that you don't want to do anything. Um, Which makes me think that this isn't really a question of culture at all. It's just a question of practicalities and how long stuff takes and how long it takes to get from you know, home to work, et cetera. Yeah, you know, when, when, when I was working for the newspaper, um, and, I, and I'm not going to say the newspaper I used to work for because I don't want to disgrace my colleagues, it was not uncommon for reporters to go to like hostess clubs and sometimes even sex clubs because, right. you know, you're, you're still on the clock and you have that need and you're not going to get home and it was kind of like, okay. Uh, it's not everybody went and some of us thought that was a little crazy, but that's sort of how things can go in Japan. And also, I think that, you know, part of your question is maybe a little bit misplaced because, you know, this program wasn't about uh, condemning Japan for being different. Uh, this, isn't right. a, this isn't a question of cultural relativism. This is, you know, we're posing a very, I think, distinct and clear question about underage sex and not, you know, Japan's sexual practices in total. Because, like I said before, I mean, well, let me ask you, do you think that high school girls who are under 18 should be taking money for sex? No, of course not. It's, I totally 
illegal, and I don't think they they should be do out there doing that. I've walked the streets myself, the streets that you've walked on, and it's midnight. I do think most of these girls should be in bed and going to school every day. So no, I agree. It's not a healthy way to yeah. grow up, and if you and if you if you believe that sex is something to be paid for, that it's a commodity, I, I think it becomes it very hard to enjoy it as something as a loving act between two people. I mean, sex, of course, sometimes is just for pleasure, but, you know, normally it should be something between two people that like each other and not an exchange of money for services. So that's sorted. That's sorted. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Well, what else have we got on the menu, Mike? <laughs> I think uh, I think we got a couple tweets, Simon. Let's. This is we're just about at the end of the show, so let's just address some of these great tweets we've been getting. Um, Elliot uh, and Ryan sent us some stuff. Elliot wants to know uh, what are the what are NGOs doing uh, to challenge the culture and possible human rights violations happening in Japan. Likewise, uh, Ryan wants to know: uh, Is the government in Japan doing their best to crack down on human trafficking, or could they be doing a better job? What do you guys think? Well, I think that the uh, NGO question we sort of talked about, Yumeno Nito, who's one of the few advocates out there um, speaking up for these girls, but the United States government has actually done a review of human trafficking um, in Japan. It does an annual one around the world for pretty much every country. And uh, Jake, I think you've got a copy of that report with you. What does it say? Uh, it said that, you know, that, that the JK business is a systematic exploitation of young school young school girls for money by various organized crime groups and individual operators that is a violation of human rights and that's something that Japan seriously needs to clamp down and deal with. Um, it's a very damning report and it is online. Uh, it, the things that the NGOs are doing here is one is they offer places for the girls to go who want to get out of the business. Um, Lighthouse Japan put out a comic book illustrating what the JK business is and the dangers are because actually comic books are one of the best ways to get young girls to read about you know what you're doing here could really be dangerous and get you in trouble um, and what does the uh, group that you're on the board of I think it's called Polaris do oh they, they changed the name to Lighthouse Japan okay. um, what they do is that they have a phone number for girls to call who need help. Um, if it's a clear case of trafficking, they take the case to the police and try and get the police to prosecute the people that are doing it. Uh, and they make people aware of uh, the fact that the JK business is very dangerous and it's not something that you should engage in. All right. Well, f um, I just wanted to add that for me, this was uh, one of the most awkward shoots that I've ever been involved in. I am a 34-year-old man with uh, prematurely gray hair, and the uh, girls in these shoots were mostly under 18, and just talking to them about this stuff was very uncomfortable. Um, and to show you just how uncomfortable it is, we're going to play you one part of the documentary, which I, the entire time we were filming it, I wish I could be somewhere else. Apparently, I can uh, chat for half an hour for 3,000 yen, which is like $30. And uh, we can also do fortune telling. Thank you. That's very kind. Okay, so what's next on the menu? あらゆる方法を駆使してアプローチするでしょって書いてあるんですけど、長所が優れた直感力がある。態度はクールでも心優しいって書いてあります。Okay, that's true。どうですか？心優しいですね。This <笑> is um, a really uncomfortable experience. Yeah, that seems really uncomfortable. And there was a couple behind us, uh, another schoolgirl and an older gentleman, um, who were just sitting there and chatting with each other. And when we looked at the footage later, it turns out that they were talking about teeth 
whitening, so not too raunchy. But the whole concept of you know being as old as I am or as old as he was, he's probably like 10, or 10 years older than I was, and sitting there with somebody who's 17 or 16 and then paying them just to chat with them, like, how do, who wants to be that guy? You know, it, it, it's the, the paying for attention and, and companionship is something that, that is ingrained in Japanese culture. Maybe they sort of serve the function as psychotherapist or something. I'm going to read the section of the trafficking report out loud because it's, it's very concise and it, it's well phrased. It'll take me one minute. Um, Japanese nationals, particularly runaway teenage girls and children of foreign and Japanese citizens who have acquired a nationality, are also subjected to sex trafficking. The phenomenon of enjo, enjo kosai, also known as compensated dating in variants of the JK business, continue to facilitate the prostitution of Japanese children. Sophisticated and organized prostitution networks target vulnerable Japanese women and girls, often in poverty or with mental and intellectual disabilities, in public areas such as subways, popular youth hangouts, schools, and online. Some of these women and girls become trafficking victims. Uh, Japanese men continue to be a significant source of demand for child sex tourism in Southeast Asia, East Asia and to a lesser extent, Mongolia. Well, um... I think that that's probably bringing us to the end of our program. Yeah, you know, Simon, I think that's a, a really good point. I, I can't think of any better place to wrap things up. So, uh, Jake, thanks a lot for coming on. Um, anything you, any last words before uh, we say goodbye? Uh, I would like to say Japan is not a, a perverse country, and when everybody is into child pornography and, uh, you know, child prostitution, it has a problem with it, and it is trying to address it. Simon, why don't you say goodbye to everybody at home? Goodbye to everybody at home. Um, I'm not exactly sure what we've got next week on the line, but I'm sure it's going to be very interesting, and it's going to be next Thursday, so you should definitely come back and check it out. I've really enjoyed talking to all of you all today, um, and see you around.